one and all in glory to him He wanted humans to be the best And give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest The one and all in glory to him He wanted humans to be the best And give his best religion to them Rasulullah Assalamu salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And welcome back to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen Wa la adwana illa ala al-zalimeen Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidi al-awwaleen wa al-akhirin Nabiina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in O ba'd My dear viewers, today's episode is a new series of the prophetic manners and etiquettes or Al-Adab Al-Mufrad which is compiled by Imam Bukhari, may Allah have mercy on him is episode number 46 and we'll begin with this following chapter Babu Al-Ihsani Ila Al-Barri Wal Fajr so this chapter will deal with the merits of being kind to both pious and the deviant and it is about the good doer, not about the recipient. So, on Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al Hanafiya, رضي الله عنهما, narrated Munzir al Thawri, on Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al Hanafiya, رضي الله عنهما, قال, هل جزاء الإحسان إلا الإحسان? قال, هي مسجلة للبر والفاجر. So, this athar, which Imam Bukhari listed here, is a statement of Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Hanafiya. Who's Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Hanafiya? We'll discuss his biography briefly after, inshallah, we mention the meaning of this text. Al-Jaza'u al-Ihsani illa al-Ihsan is a segment of Surah Ar-Rahman, verse number 60, in Surah Ar-Rahman, the Almighty Allah says, Is the reward for any good, but what is good? Is the repayment of kindness anything except kindness? That is in Surah Ar-Rahman, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ So this is hadith number 130. Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Hanafiya says in his commentary on this ayah of Surah Ar-Rahman, he said, which means it is not denied for either the pious or the deviant. In other words, doing kindness and treating kindly people is not simply related to the recipient. Uh, nor is it only if a good doer and a pious person does good deeds, it will be accepted and Allah will reward him for it. But also, if a wicked person does a good deed, the Almighty Allah will reward him for it and will accept it from him. So what do we have here? Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Hanafiya. Muhammad is also the uh, brother of al-Hasan and al-Husayn and Muhsin. I know there is al-Hasan and al-Husayn, but I didn't know there is Muhsin. Yes, they're all the children of Ali and Fatima. May Allah be pleased with them. And in fact, Muhammad is their brother, have brother. They share the same father. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu And his mother, a woman who was, uh, you know, uh, a slave woman. She was a prisoner of war and Ali ibn Abi Talib freed her. And her name is al Hanafiya from al Yamama. So that's why they recognize him by saying Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al Hanafiya, referring to his mother as well. So Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Hanafiya radiyallahu anhu commented on the ayah of Surah Ar-Rahman Hal jaza'u al-ihsan illa al-ihsan He said this ayah applies to everyone whether bar, pious, fajr, wicked or deviant. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith Inna al-kafira 
إذا عمل حسنة أطعم بها طعمة في الدنيا وإن المؤمن إذا عمل حسنة أطعم بها طعمة في الدنيا على ما يدخره له الله في الآخرة What does this mean? The Almighty Allah is the most just and he is the most generous and whenever somebody does a good deed he does a reward for it as is rather his reward his compensation his payment is way greater provided the person is a believer even if the person is a disbeliever and does a good deed the almighty will reward him for it in the life of this world but as far as the reward in the hereafter the reward of the hereafter is jannah and allah announced and declared in the quran that jannah will not be receiving any non-believers إن الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب والمشركين في نار جهنم خالدين فيها أبدا. So in multiple verses, the Almighty Allah announced, declared, and warned that those who disbelieve in the oneness of Allah, whether from the people of the book or from the pagans or magans or fire worshippers or whatever. They shall abide in hellfire eternally. As for the believers, they shall enter Jannah. Even the sinners among them, if they have to be purified in Annar, in hellfire, but eventually for believing in the oneness of Allah, they will end us, they will end up in paradise. The difference between a believer and a non-believer in doing good righteous deeds, that whenever the non-believer does a good righteous deed, feeds a pet, takes care of an orphan, looks after his parents, he is charitable, he is honest, all of that is appreciate, appreciated by Allah. And they will receive a full payment and recompense of reward for it in this life, as far as increase risk, provision, fame, name, uh, wealth, health, protection, but if they die in a state of disbelief, لَيْسَ لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ نَصِيبِ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ They have no share of their word in the hereafter whatsoever. For the believers, whenever they do good deeds, they will be rewarded for it. In this life, الْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا إِلَى سَبْعِمِئَةَ ضَعْفٍ إِلَى أَضْعَافٍ كَثِيرًا Each one single good deed will be rewarded for it 10 times more, up to 700 times, up to a limited number of times. Wallahu yudha'ifu liman yasha, and Allah multiplies the reward way beyond that for whomever he wills. MashaAllah. So here, musajjalatun lil barri wal fajr, when Allah the Almighty says, is the reward with the compensation for kindness, anything other than kindness? And this is a rhetorical question. And the answer is already known. Of course not. Anyone who does good shall be paid back by Allah what is good. The only difference, if a non-believer does it, the reward will be only in this dunya, in the life of this world. Hereafter, there is no reward for the good doers of those who associated others with Allah in worship. No matter what kind of deity that they associated with Allah or they ascribe to Allah as a partner, a son, a human being, an angel, a mountain, fire, or whatever. The following chapter, Babu Fadli Man Ya'ulu Yatima, the chapter deals with the excellence of those who sponsor and take care of orphans, who provide for orphans. Hadith number 131. An Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu, an in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as sa'i ala al armalati wal masakini kal mujahidi fi sabilillah. 
وَكَالَّذِي يَصُومُ النَّهَارَ وَيَقُومُ اللَّيْلِ The word asai literally means the person who strives, who strives to earn his living and not only his living. His living and in order to provide for a widow and poor or orphans. The reward, as the Prophet ﷺ said in this sound hadith, the person who strives on behalf of the widows and the poor is like those who strive in the way of Allah, like Al-Mujahid on the battlefield, and like those who fast on daily basis and pray at night on daily basis as well. This is a continuous and an unstoppable work. As-Sa'i is mentioned in the Quran, as you know, <coughs> the Almighty Allah said, <coughs> وَأَن لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى As-Sa'i is the pursuit, the struggle, and the strive. When a person leaves home early morning with the intent of finding a job, finding work, earning his provision, providing for his family and for others, definitely this is for the sake of Allah. Allah appreciates that and he will be rewarded. Not only that, he will get paid uh, in this dunya, but the Almighty Allah will reward him for his uh, striving, for his effort in the hereafter. What about if in addition to providing for his family, he happens to provide for others, those who are weak, those who are vulnerable, those who cannot afford and don't have an access to work and earn their living. In this case, the reward of such person, the person who works to provide for Armala, a widow, and a widow may have orphans as well, while miskeen, poor, who cannot afford to earn or they earn and they work hard, but their uh, earning is barely sufficient for them. They're living hand to mouth. So they still need somebody's help, charity. So a person who works and by the end he has in his mind, if I make a hundred dollar, ten dollars is going, ten dollars are going to such and such family. Uh, ten dollars today are going to such and such family in India and 15 to such and such family, he barely saves for himself and his family 15, 20 dollars and he's earning most of it, half of it is being distributed to sponsor those who are in need. Guess what is his reward? Whether he's making only a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand or a million per month. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah is so happy with him. Allah will reward him a reward similar to the fighter on the battlefield, the mujahid fi sabilillah. Yeah? Yeah. And similar to a person who stands up in prayer on every single night. We're talking about tahajjud, the night prayer. And a reward similar to the person who fasts on every single day, not every other day, not on Mondays and Thursdays, no. A person who fasts on every single day. I can just say uh, we're done with the hadith and move on to another hadith because the meaning is very obvious. But to be honest with you, it is not easy whatsoever for a working family father to say 10% or 15% or more or less of my earning daily or monthly. I'm going to dedicate it to support or sponsor, or sponsor orphans. It is not easy because nowadays, during this time, uh, it is back to school. My wife is returning and she said, guess what? You know how much I spent today? Only for the school uniform. I said, oh my God. And then guess what? We have to go to the bookstore in order to buy the school supplies and the school tuitions, and the allowance of the kids, and the school bus, we pay for the school bus as well, or buses, when you have a bunch of kids. So right away, what crosses your mind, that's it, I'm not giving away anything this month, and the next few months, 
because I myself drained and broke. But a person who no matter what kind of responsibilities and commitment that he owes and he has, he has a share in his wealth because he knows that at least I can work and earn. And I know that there is sister so and so, her husband has the way he was a teacher. He didn't leave much behind. As a matter of fact, they have to pay for the rent of their flat. And the landlord is very tough on them. If they are late, he threatens to kick them out and throw their furniture outside in the street. So they're stuck. And that's why, look, before I give my wife her allowance, before I decide what to do with my salary, there's 15%, there's 20%. That is going towards helping others. How many times I mentioned to you, and you are my bigger family, that I have a few friends who do that. One of them, I took advantage when he was sick, being treated in the hospital in London. I visited him and I asked him, because I see him a very ordinary person. And the kind of business that he's investing in went through calamities. A lot of people in the country in the same business were bankrupt. Uh, cow mania, chicken flu, birds flu, whatever. So he's in the livestock. Subhanallah. So he told me the secret. He said, when I started off my business and I used to walk barefooted because we were broke, we were very poor. So I decided that 10% of every buck I make, fi sabilillah. Are you talking about zakah? No. A zakah is different. He's going to pay the zakah once he starts possessing the nisab, and he will pay it on an annual basis, which is 2.5%. But I'm talking about voluntary charity, where he declared that Allah has a share in every penny I make. Another friend of mine, but he passed away, may Allah have mercy on him, he started off by, there were nine partners, and they were all newly graduated, and, you know, very humble beginning. So they wanted a tenth one. He said, I have the tenth. Allah is going to be our tenth partner in the business. What do you mean? He said, as we're nine, Every $100 we make, $10 out of it, of the profit, that goes fi sabilillah. This is Allah's share. They all applauded the idea. Because in the beginning, it wasn't much. How much are you making a day? 50, 100. But when they started making millions on daily basis, the 10% have increased. And not only that, they have increased the percentage of Allah's share to 20, then to 30, and a friend of mine to 50%. And this is how an ordinary person became a billionaire. Because Allah has a share in that investment. In a sense, he knows that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever you give any charity, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَتَقَبَّلُهَا بِيَمِينِ The Almighty will accept it in his own right hand. This is what the Prophet said. ثُمَّ يُرَبِّيَهَا لَهُ كَمَا يُرَبِّي أَحَدُكُمْ فَلُوَّهُ Then Allah will grow the reward for this charity, which was done for the sake of Allah. You put it in the hand of the poor, or the orphan, or the widow. But Allah said that He would accept it Himself in His right hand, morally, in order to augment the reward. Like when he's raising his baby horse until it becomes a grown-up horse, until it becomes like a mountain. Can you imagine such wealth in which Allah has a share in that investment and has a share? I hope people do not take it literally and they say that Allah has a share in the investment. But we give fi sabilillah to the poor and our intent is ibtigha'a mardatillah. Seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say Allah's share, it means the share of the poor and the orphans, the needy ones and the widows. All right? And this is how they prosper. And this is how they 
managed by the name of Allah to overcome every obstacle and to be saved from every calamity that financially, even during the market crisis, uh, the mortgage crisis, and the uh, when the uh, when there was a recession worldwide, 2008, they still prospered. They didn't suffer like the rest of people in the same field or the same business. Masha Allah. So, the hadith is recommending for each and every one of us. Even if your salary is barely enough for you, you can increase the blessings in it by deciding that there is a share in your income, in your salary, in the money that you're making on a monthly basis that goes to the poor and the needy, especially if it is towards supporting the orphans and the widows. Whenever you visit uh, a widow who's looking after orphans and you see their condition nowadays, especially with the inflation worldwide, you realize that those people have been forgotten. No, they haven't been forgotten. They have been forgotten by ordinary people. But the Almighty Allah cast the love of doing good deeds and reminded you of this family because he loves you. And if it was not you, he would do it with anyone else whom he loves. And this family will not be lost. Allah will take care of them. So it's simply only an honor for you. Only an honor for you to be part of it. As-sa'i ala al-armalati wal-miskeen kal-mujahidi fi sabi'lillah. Wa kal-sa'imi la yuftur wa kal-qa'imi la yuftur. As it is mentioned in another narration, his reward is similar to the reward of a person who's fighting on the battlefield for the sake of Allah. And similar to a person who stands up at night in prayer, non-stop on every single night, and the word of a person who fasts on every single day, no break whatsoever. May Allah make us among them. Shall we take another hadith? Why not? Those hadith are so beautiful. They are tendering our hearts. They make us better believers. And they make us very enthusiastic. And they encourage us to do good deeds, especially towards others. Well, we know that. Why do you have to repeat it? I'm saying it because if you feel your heart being softened, then take advantage. Right away say, I'm going to do this. And write it down. Include it in writing. Tell your wife. Or sometimes you like to keep it between you and Allah. Like Zainul Abidin, uh, Ibn Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, who used to carry the sacks of flour, sugar, and whatever and butter on a monthly basis. Every family of the poor families will find the sack of flour. They will find the sugar. They will find the oil, the butter, the dates uh, stacked in front of their house before Fajr. And when they opened, they found plenty of goodness, like welfare. No one ever knew who is delivering this food supplies for them on a monthly basis. Until he died, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, his family, and his grandfather, Prophet Muhammad When he died, when they came to wash his body for the funeral, <coughs> they found a huge scar on his back as a result of carrying the heavy load of the flour and the stuff on daily, ba on monthly basis, and no one. No one knew who was doing so until he died when the supply was interrupted. So you can keep it in private between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you show it to your kids and your wife in order to get them involved and to say, if I die, please resume this kind deed that I do, it is also welcome. In tubidu sadaqati hi. If you show your charity, it is excellent. But if you conceal it and you give it to the poor and those are eligible, it is better for you. When it is better, when you're afraid that Nigeria or show off or pride will uh, enter your heart and mess up your intention. But when you are in control of your intention and ikhlas, and also want to encourage others to do like you, and maintain what you're doing, then 
indeed there is better fani'immahi babu fadli man ya'ulu yatiman lah i love the shep i love it so much the virtue of someone who provides for his orphan what does it mean we're talking about uh, the mother the widow who lost her husband and now she's in charge of providing for her orphans she's been afflicted and allah does not waste her word effort and patience you better listen to the following hadith and i know once i quoted somebody who say sheikh didn't we study this hadith in riyadh salihin before yes indeed but it is mentioned once again and let's study it one more time not necessarily in the same depth as before hadith number 132 an aisha ta zawj an-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qalat ja'atni imra'atun ma'aha ibnatan laha فسألتني فلم تجد عندي إلا تمرة واحدة فأعطيتها فقسمتها فقسمتها بين ابنتيها ثم قامت فخرجت فدخل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فحدثته فقال من يلي من هذه البنات شيئا فأحسن إليهن كن له سترا من النار Aisha, the mother of the believers, may Allah be pleased with her, narrated that once a woman came to me and she had two orphans, two daughters, whom she was looking after. So she asked me for something to provide for them. I didn't have anything but a single date. So I gave it to her. So the woman the mother of the two widows divided it between her daughters and then she got up and left she didn't eat anything so the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said when he came and Aisha radiyallahu anha informed him about this incident he said peace be upon him whoever looks after these orphans these girls in a way in any way which is a good way and is good to them will have them as a veil for him again is hafa i know you're going to say but the other hadith the narration was slightly different the woman came to the uh, aisha radiyallahu anha and aisha had only three dates and so she gave the three dates to the woman uh, i know someone would say what would a date do man <coughs> three dates <coughs> excuse me so she gave every girl one date and when she was about to eat the third the two girls were staring at her and the date in her hand about to put it in her mouth so she split it into half and then she divided it between her daughters and she didn't eat any when aisha informed the messenger of allah when he returned he said are you amazed at what she did she said of course he said indeed allah has forgiven her sins and admitted her to jannah yani has decreed that this woman shall enter jannah because of what she did allah is most generous hal jaza al ihsan illa al ihsan and in this narration the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever whoever is blessed or tested with these orphans and then he treats them kindly and t- <coughs> takes care of them kun lahu hijaban min an-nar wa sitra min an-nar that the almighty allah will bless him and will make them as a veil to protect him against hell fire it is time to take a short break and inshallah we'll be back in a few minutes you stay tuned rasulullah habiballah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second segment in today's Gardens of the Fires live program. We have some callers on the line, but before that, I would like to remind you that all our phone numbers should appear on the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions, you can dial any of the following numbers. Saeed from Liberia, welcome to Huda TV. Uh, 
I have two questions. Said Salama. Okay. Now, um, the first question has to do with um, we understand that it is supposed to be paid on the profit of uh, your your business, but then my uh, and uh, my problem is normally you'll be able to determine your profit at the end of the cycle, which probably it's about eighteen to twenty months which is more than a year. So in this case, how is a zakah going to be calculated? Well, Saeed, I do apologize. Your connection is not really good. So maybe, inshallah, one of our colleagues in the control can collect Saeed's question from Liberia. And we'll try another caller, please. Mohammed from... Mohammed from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum. Well, by the time we uh, connect with the caller, I would like, on behalf of myself, Huda TV family, and all the viewers, to extend our condolences to Sheikh Abdurrahman al Jaki's family. He had lost uh, his mother uh, yesterday. She was a half of the Quran, and she was a great Quranic teacher, and she had mastered the Quran in various qira'at uh, by the grace of Allah. I've attended a few years back her uh, graduation ceremony when she had finished memorizing the Quran and obtained the Ijaza. She was in her 60s, and while she had attended a class to teach Quran on her way home, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, we all belong to Allah until Him we shall return. Um, she died in a car accident. So we hope and we anticipate that the Almighty Allah. Uh, we'll count her among the martyrs and a shuhada and may Allah elevate her status into the highest place in heaven, into al firdaus al-A'la with the prophets and the righteous ones. And also may Allah grant patience to uh, our brother, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, and the rest of his family, Ibrahim and others, and obviously to the father, who is a very pious man, we know him very well. May Allah have mercy uh, on the wife and may Allah grant patience to the entire Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Samra from Canada, welcome to Huda TV. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, rahmatullahi. Bismillah. What is your question, Samra? Sheikh, uh, my question is that I recently got an ankle sac fracture, so they gave me a removable cast to wear on the feet. So inside the cast, there is a sock that is open from both ways. So what happened, I wore that sock uh, and then the cast was removable. But for almost 10 days, I was not uh, removing the cast. And while doing the wudu, I was just wiping over the cast. Although I could remove it, but my feet was hurting a lot. So I, and I did not know very well. And then later on, my husband said that you could not do it, that you cannot wipe the cast. and but I prayed almost 10 days doing the same wudu, like just wiping it over. Uh, but then when he said that, then I was just removing the cast and then wiping under uh, the feet. So I don't know what should I do about those 10 days. Should I repeat those salah um, when I was wiping over the cast, although I could remove it. So uh, I'm pretty confused uh, about uh, no, in what inshallah, I Inshallah, I will answer you. First of all, I hope and I pray that you're feeling better now and you've fully recovered. With regards to the cast, there are some casts which are uh, removable. But if your doctor said do not remove the cast for 10 days, then you are 100% eligible to wipe over the cast after you make wudu and you wash the rest of your body parts which are required to be washed during wudu and then wipe uh, to, uh, to wash during wudu, and then wipe on top of the cast. But if it is 
if it was maybe twisting ankle and it was simply only while walking or putting pressure or stress uh, on your foot, you have to wear the cast. And otherwise, you could remove the cast. Then it is not valid to skip washing the foot. You must wash uh, every body part that is mentioned in ayah number six, chapter number five, surah al-Ma'idah, uh, with regards to wudu. يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا قمتم إلى الصلاة فاغسلوا وجوهكم وأيديكم إلى المرافق وامسحوا برؤوسكم وأرجلكم إلى الكعبين. So if it was removable and it doesn't cause no cause any harm, so it's simply like pair of socks or boots. Uh, in this case, if you keep it deliberately without a medical reason, okay. Uh, then wudu was invalid if you kept it for 10 days and it was easy to remove it and you did not have any problem removing it it was just simply you chose not to remove it but if your doctor said you should keep the cast on and do not remove it unless and until I tell you then simply every time you wipe on top of the cast was permissible we all understand with regards to the socks, as long as they cover all the feet, including the ankles. If I make wudu and I wash my feet, then I put my socks on. MashaAllah, I have 24 hours from the moment I wipe. Uh, the next time I make wudu, I can keep it on, keep them on. And, and instead of making wudu again, I can wipe on top of my socks or long boots. Likewise, in the case of the cast, Provided it's covering the foot, so the toes are not showing. But if it was otherwise easy to remove, and you did not remove it, and the doctor said you should, uh, you shouldn't have any problem removing it. Obviously, you have to repeat all the prayers which you prayed without washing your foot. May Allah make it easy for all of us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Aisha from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, my question is uh, about um, that. Should I attend wedding of my close relatives? And uh, a wedding is like there is music, there is um, free mixing, and there is something. Uh, which is not permissible in our religion. And if I say no to them, so they think that I have an attitude and they get angry. And they think like um, you have an attitude, so that's why you are not coming to our wedding. So what should I say? Because they don't follow religion, so they don't understand that what our religion says. So what should I do? Should I go or not? Thank you so much. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, Aisha, if you know beforehand, it's going to be music, mix, free mixing and singing and maybe drinking, as you said, or as I may have heard it, then it is not permissible to attend, whether the, whether it is for work reason or a wedding or a banquet or whatever. It is not permissible to be present in a place where you know that there will be sins and major sins being observed there. Thank you. Barakallahu people. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Ashraf from Ashraf from Nigeria. Can you hear me? No. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ashraf, how can I no. help you? Um, I have two questions here. So, the first one is that why, why is there a um, different view from the scholars? And Unfortunately, connection is bad. The, uh, uh, now, the first question here. Yeah, uh, uh, what, what I'm talking about is uh, why are there different views in translating the Quran from um, different scholars? And the second one is that is mining of Pi and some other cryptocurrency alive. So that, that is my two questions. Well, let, let me see one thing at a time. You, you, your first question was about, uh, you know, the translation of the Quran. Am I correct? Uh, yes. Why are they different view from the scholars? I 
I mean, what are their different views uh, as in, in translating the Quran? So, like, um, there are some, there are some um, words that the scholar has said, and uh, God is talking about um, the sun, God is talking about um, reindeer. So, what are their different views? Yeah, I mean, different meaning. Well, no? obviously, there are too many different translations, and uh, it is so much required that the translator, whether an individual or a committee, they should master both languages, Arabic language and its eloquence and all its sciences, in addition to the language that is being translated to, whether it is Sawahili or Hausa or English or French. Well, unfortunately, a lot of people happen to study here and there, so they know uh, partially Arabic, or they know a little bit of Arabic. So they give themselves the right to translate it to their mother tongue. They know the language that they're translating to, but they don't know Arabic very well. So that's why we have the uh, you know variety of translations, which many of them are not true. If you ask me right now, uh, you know, a good translation, the translation of uh, the Nobel Quran, which is issued by uh, the uh, Quran complex in Medina Munawwara, it is fair, it is balanced, it is to the point, it doesn't use complicated uh, grammar, it doesn't use Shakespeare English, simple English. Fiktal, likewise, is a good translation. This is as far as uh, English. But if you ask me about Hausa or Sawahili, my answer would be, I have no idea. Barakallah fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Arshian from USA, welcome to Huda TV, Arshian. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Arshian. How can I help you? Uh, Sheikh, I had a quick question because I recently moved to the U.S. from India and uh, my biggest challenge here has been finding uh, halal food. And uh, one complication I see uh, in the U.S. are people eating chicken in Mexican restaurants, Chinese restaurants, any place and everywhere. Muslims, mashallah, practicing Muslims five times, they're praying salah, but I see them eating in Chinese and, uh, you know, Mexican hotels, even though we do not know whether they, that's halal or not. So I walked up to the local imam in the masjid and I asked him, uh, can you please let me know? And the imam himself said, I myself eat from those hotels. <laughs> I was a bit, a restaurant, so I was a bit shocked. And the, and the uh, reasoning he gave was, he said, Kullu Dajjaj fi Amrika Halal. I was like, on what lo logic is that? So the sheikh said that uh, we are living in the land of Christians, Ahl al Kitab, and the Zabiha of Ahl al Kitab is Halal. But here we are, we do not even know if those Chinese, Mexicans or Christ or the other restaurants are actually run by Christians. And even though America is a Christian country, I don't know, it's no longer Christian to be honest because we've got atheists, we've got agnostics, we've got people from different religions and we have no idea about slot the slaughter. Yes, they, you know, there is people who say we do not need to verify and go deep. But uh, I, I personally feel it is not right to be eating from that. Alhamdulillah, I'm trying to stay because there are a lot of halal places available as well. But then the problem is it is uh, uh, so many Muslim brothers are directly just walking in and giving fatwas that it is allowed that, you know, the majority of the Muslims are just following these people. So what, what do you think should be done in this case, Sheikh, where you know halal is available? But then there is a fatwa which is given where, you know, because it is uh, Ahl al-Kitab land, you can eat their meat. How do you justify the Sheikh or what do you think is the right view of the scholars in this? Sorry, that was a long question, Sheikh. Thank you. Thank you, Arshian from the USA. And uh, uh, the question is very serious and it is everyone's question. Every Muslim who moves to the US or is born and raised in the US and some people have completely neglected this matter altogether and they say Bismillah and eat and some people are very, uh, mashallah, conservative. Uh, I myself, my parents would not eat the chicken from the local stores. Rather, only when I go to the farm and I observe the process of slaughtering myself or I slaughter and then they process the meat and I bring it home. So my mother would eat, my father would eat and they would cook out of it. 
and alhamdulillah. Uh, otherwise, we used to go and buy from so-called halal meat uh, store. Uh, when we go out, we eat seafood, fish, prawns, whatever, in order to avoid eating meat. But if it is known in a country which is predominantly Christian, okay, whether they practice Christianity or not, they're called Ahlul Kitab. This is what Allah named them. Whether they are, uh, you know, they, they follow the true teachings of Jesus or they don't, because the Quran said so in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number five, twice the Almighty Allah declared that those who say Jesus, the son of Mary, is God or the son of God are disbelievers. Yet in the same chapter in verse number five, Allah said it is okay to eat the food, the meat which was slaughtered, not killed. So the main concern is the process of slaughtering, not killing, not by stun gun, not by suffocation or strangling or execution. You know, if this is done, then it's not permissible to eat it, even if the Imam himself is the one who uh, killed the uh, animal uh, with a stun gun or with the uh, electrocution or whatever. So this is number one concern. Number two concern is the processing itself and whether it is processed along with haram like uh, swine flesh or not. So I will leave it there and I would say, you know, Amja, the Sharia Scholar Association of North America stated that according to the local law in the U.S., the chicken which are being slaughtered there are halal to eat. And they have a concern with the beef because of the stunning with the stun gun uh, and so on. This matter needs to be studied further. And every state has their own constitution. If you know there is a halal meat uh, store or a grocery store, buy it from there and alhamdulillah you'll be in the safe side. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us and grant us forgiveness, pardon us, and guide us to what is best. I leave you in the care of the Almighty. I call you Qawli Hada, wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. Allah, our God, is the greatest, the one and only, the most high, the most to them so why did they ignore that forgetting all about him in paradise worshiping cows fire and stones selling the best with the cheapest price so why did they ignore that forgetting all about hell and paradise worshiping cows fire and stones selling their best with the cheapest price